morning, everyone. Mr. Pichek is here today to provide the latest on our data and modeling. As you'll see, we continue to do well here in Vermont, and we're not seeing the jump in cases we thought we would at this point. But what you'll also see is that other parts of the country are continuing to struggle, and cases are still ticking up in our region, uh, including amongst our Canadian neighbors. So I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record, if you even know what that means, but I really need Vermonters to know how important it is to not become complacent. Vermonters have done an incredible job since March, following the guidance and protecting each other. But with the positive trends we've had for months, I know it can be easy to let your guard down, to get out more, see more friends, go to more gatherings, interact with more and with different groups, sit a little closer, stay a little longer, and pull that mask down more often. And I get it. We're a victim of our own success. But the safety measures we have in place are there for a reason, and they're working. It's why we've been able to increase our activities and keep the economy open. But, but if we let up and get more relaxed, all the hard work we've done can slip away as well, just like we've seen in other places like Hawaii, Montana, and even Wyoming. As Commissioner Pichek will talk about, national modeling shows that the country should expect an uptick in cases in the coming months. But as Dr. Fauci said, it isn't inevitable here in Vermont. We put ourselves in a great position, and we don't want to move backward. But the future is really in our hands. That's why I'm urging all Vermonters to continue to follow the guidance, to keep track of what you're doing and how many people you're coming in contact with, and make these decisions thoughtfully. So wear a mask. Keep six feet apart even amongst friends. Avoid large crowds, especially indoors, and follow the travel guidance. It's up to all of us to maintain and expand on the gains we've made so we can continue to move forward and set an example for the rest of the country. I thank you all for your hard work, and I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichak. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so we'll start today with um, an overview of some national data before turning to Vermont. Um, and then we'll also hit on some of the points that Governor made about complacency, uh, some issues that are happening right on our borders and very close to home as well uh, that we want to overview and provide some context on. And then we'll provide our regional update and our travel map update, as always. And uh, for those that are interested, please visit uh, dfr.vermont.gov uh, to see our full uh, presentation and all past presentations as well. So as the governor mentioned, uh, cases continue to be in a good position here in Vermont, but nationally and even internationally, we continue to pass grim milestones. Just last night, uh, the, United, the world passed one million COVID deaths since the start of the pandemic. We just mentioned that last week at our update that the United States had crested over 200,000 deaths. So. This is really a, a grim milestone uh, for uh, the world, particularly when you consider how many of the deaths in the United States uh, make up the world's count. We see also that the United States uh, surpassed 7 million cases just in the last few days as well. Some good news there. The, the, the amount of time it took us to get between 6 million and 7 million did increase gradually, um, but it's still a very high number and a very quick pace to be continuing to add millions of cases uh, to our count here uh, in the United States. Looking at where these cases fall across the country over the last 14 days, you can continue to see that we have very low prevalence here in the Northeast, particularly in Vermont, with very, very low prevalence. Uh, and then you see some parts of the country that continue to struggle, places that haven't necessarily struggled back last spring or over the summer, North and South Dakota, uh, parts of Iowa, parts of Wisconsin. Uh, and even parts um, in Tennessee and Mississippi and Alabama. So there are new places that are emerging as hotspots. They've really been hotspots for probably the last two or three weeks, but they continue to see new case growth um, as the rest of the country does see some improvement 
Uh, but we do see, as the governor mentioned, an uptick here in the Northeast, not in Vermont, but around our neighbors that we'll mention uh, in a moment. Turning to Vermont data, again, all very in encouraging, uh, all very favorable news to us. We reported uh, from last week uh, uh, another 26 cases. So last week we had 25. Uh, this week we had 26 cases. This is the lowest two-week period we've had in cases uh, since back in late May. Uh, so that gives you, again, an indication of how low our case count is, even with K-12 through reopening and higher education reopening. And here's a moment just to pause and weave in this concept of not to be complacent. The last time we had case counts this low, we did see our largest outbreak uh, in the state uh, just that following week. So a good reminder that even though case counts are low, that can change quickly uh, even in places like Vermont. But as we'll see, it also changes quickly in some other examples uh, close by. Turning to our reopening uh, metrics, these are all, again, trending very favorably. Syndromic surveillance uh, is very low. Our growth rate uh, is very low. We have the lowest seven-day per capita um, infection rate in the country still. Uh, on percent positivity, again, lowest in the country for the last seven days of 0.15 percent. That's even lower than what we talked about a couple of weeks ago at 0.20 uh, percent. So continuing to see a very low positivity rate there. And then in hospital capacity, um, still good hospital capacity available. No one in the ICU, no one even in the hospital for COVID-19 as, as of today, this morning. So all good trends there uh, when it comes to our restart metrics. Turning to the testing averages, we haven't talked about this for the last couple of weeks, but I think good to highlight that our testing did increase quite considerably with the start of college and with many colleges continuing to do periodic testing during the semester, those testing numbers have stayed quite high. Uh, of course, there's also unaffiliated college testing that's going on that's still quite robust as well. And when you look at where we stand in the country on the next slide, uh, both on the y-axis, which is the uh, number of um, infections, uh, or sorry, number of tests, and on the x-axis, which is the number of infections, you can see uh, that we rank fourth per capita in the number of tests we're doing per capita. Uh, and then still number one on infections, and this is during the last 30-day period. So testing is very robust in Vermont, continues to be, particularly when compared to um, our counterparts across the country. So that all um, good news. Looking at our forecast, our most recent updated forecast, we see some improvement here, like the governor mentioned. Uh, we now sort of crest below uh, 20 cases, somewhere in that 15 to 16 cases. That's the projection uh, out into uh, later part of October into November. That's really taking into account our improved case count as of the last two weeks. So again, this incorporates continued higher ed, continued K through 12, and all the increased mobility that we think we'll see associated with both of those activities, but still a rather mild uh, projected increase uh, here in Vermont. And again, we haven't seen that increase yet, so that's a favorable sign also. So with all that good news, um, we just want to hit on some points here about avoiding complacency because there are areas very close to home uh, that are struggling currently uh, with the virus. Um, but first, let's start with a projection or a couple of projections that we have nationwide. So IHME is one of the modeling organizations that we follow and partner with. Another modeler, modeler uh, who is independent, uh, GU, these are two different models here that we've presented. One goes through the beginning of the year, uh, and the other goes through uh, the beginning of November. But they both tell a similar story, which is that cases nationally, this is not in Vermont, but nationally, uh, are expected to rise as we get into the colder months of later October, November, and as you can see on the IHME chart, into December uh, and the beginning of January. So as the governor pointed out, um, you know, this is going to be a challenge that we're going to face uh, across the country and here in Vermont. Um, if we don't continue to do all the things everyone's been doing so well, uh, we have the risk of, of falling uh, into this trend. But we do not, this trend is not inevitable. We can avoid this certainly by continuing all the good habits that Vermonters have exhibited since the beginning uh, of the pandemic. Again, just north of us uh, in Quebec, they had been uh, battling the coronavirus very well, as had all of Canada. But just in the last three weeks, you can start to see a really a, a quite dramatic increase in cases just north of the border. You know, we talked a lot back in March and April about exponential growth. And when you kind of look at this trend here, you look at the number of cases week over week, they're getting pretty close to that with cases almost doubling on a weekly basis. So this is approaching the levels that they saw back at the height of the pandemic uh, back uh, in April uh, and March. Uh, so something really to keep an eye on. They're starting to implement 
uh, measures to slow the growth, asking people to stop socializing, to stay at home. They're not canceling uh, school. They're not closing businesses, but they are taking initial steps to try to slow the spread. So again, I think just right north of us, I mean, touching Vermont and Quebec, you can see that uh, cases can rise quickly, uh, particularly as things start to open up and we become more mobile. So all the more reason to stay vigilant on those um, main principles that we've been talking about. And just to hit on another example uh, that is again close to home, just over in Maine, we talked about this a number of weeks ago when we updated our travel map and we saw that red county uh, in the middle of Maine. And I think everyone's become very familiar with this case uh, and the wedding situation that happened in Maine. But it has some really um, important lessons and the CDC director in Maine has emphasized these same messages that we're trying to point out here about needing to follow guidelines both on the individual stamp, uh, standpoint and also on the institution standpoint, making sure that institutions are continuing to follow state guidance uh, and also that uh, Vermonters, just like Mainers, don't become complacent uh, with how much uh, success we've had uh, dealing with the virus to date. But in Maine, you can see that they had um, a wedding that connected now to 180 cases throughout that state, eight deaths. None of those people that passed away had attended the wedding. Uh, so that in, its, in and of itself is a good example of how um, this virus can spread and impact people well beyond your immediate family members, immediate community. Uh, now, uh, much of the uh, situation is um, in York County, that southern county in Maine. You're seeing that York County is growing at rates that are really much more significant than the rest of the state. And even a particular town in York County uh, where uh, the pastor from that wedding lives is seeing quite um, specifically quite uh, significant growth over the last two and a half weeks. So just again, uh, in middle part, early part of April, or early part of August, that, Wayne, that main wedding event occurred, uh, just over 60 attendees in violation of the state guidelines of 50 people indoors. Um, you saw that, again, it was indoors. There was little mask wearing, little social distancing, 18 cases associated with that wedding. But quickly, as the slide shows, that spread to other facilities across Maine, spread to a rehabilitation center. Uh, that resulted in, tw in 39 cases, seven deaths from this event. And what is concerning, again, in terms of institutional breakdown and needing to be vigilant, is that uh, the individual uh, who works at that facility came in contact with somebody from the wedding and was showing symptoms on the day that she was working at that facility. She had put that into the tracker that they were using. She had four different symptoms. But the institution itself, the Rehabilitation Center, did not check that to determine that she should not have been working that day. And she worked a 10-hour shift overnight and then you can see that it spread throughout that facility. Similarly, the other outbreak that occurred uh, happened in York with, related to a jail, 85 cases in that incident. Um, similarly, uh, guidance was not strictly adhered to. Um, they weren't doing symptom checks at the jail. They weren't doing good mask wearing at the jail, um, all in violation of Maine's guidance that has been provided. Uh, and you can see the result there. Similarly, um, at the uh, associate with this uh, Baptist church in York County. This was where the pastor had been uh, the minister at the wedding. Uh, Ten cases associated with that religious organization. Um, but again, just getting a sense of how widespread and different situations uh, this one event happened uh, in Maine and how quickly it spread throughout the state. Now, uh, finally, you can see uh, all the different outbreaks. Not all of them are associated directly with the Maine wedding event, but now at this point, um, via their CDC director in Maine, there's such high level of community transition, uh, community transmission happening in York County uh, that it's hard to sort of differentiate any of these events uh, from the specific link in, Maine, in, the, in the wedding. But you can see they range from uh, the jail uh, to a workplace, to a school, to a restaurant, uh, to um, a family function, to, a to other work sites. So really uh, critical here to stay on top of um, of these guidance, really critical not to become complacent. Uh, that, I think, was the main takeaway from the main uh, CDC director was that he was worried both, again, individuals and institutions were becoming too complacent with their success and certainly something we don't want to uh, replicate here in Vermont. Quickly, just speeding through the higher ed update, uh, again, still very good news here in Vermont. 
Uh, one uh, outfit recently, uh, as of yesterday actually, ranked Vermont as the safest place to reopen schools based on 15 different metrics, uh, both on case growth and in terms of planning and, and capacity and resources for school reopening. Uh, so that's reaffirming to see, but of course I think that's something that uh, we kind of knew uh, all along. Uh, you see that we have the four cases that are confirmed still here uh, in Vermont with one presumptive case that Dr. Levine I'm sure we'll talk more about. Uh, but compared to New Hampshire, where we see 53 cases in K through 12, uh, in Maine that's now up to 32 cases, we still are, you know, comparing quite favorably even to those states that have low uh, prevalence in their communities. So continue to really strong reopening for K through 12. Uh, looking at higher ed, 24,000 new tests conducted uh, since the last time we provided an update. Uh, four new cases reported, um, and you can see from the beginning over 81,000 tests conducted uh, in the uh, higher education reopening for about 47 positive cases, so very low positivity rate. And again, continued success there on the reopening. Looking again to New Hampshire and to Maine, you can see that we uh, you know, are very favorable compared to those two places as well, but all are very stable. Uh, again, reinforcing the message that if you have low prevalence, uh, you can safely reopen uh, your uh, schools uh, and your economy as well. Quickly going through the regional data, Again, we mentioned cases are, are increasing uh, across those uh, neighbors around us, particularly in Quebec. Uh, we saw an increase of about 19% week over week of cases. If you did take Quebec out of that, the increase was about 7%, so still an increase, but uh, much less uh, when you take Quebec out of that equation. Uh, so something that we still need to be very vigilant on. You can see on the next slide that we've had a number of weeks of increased new case growth. So again, data in Vermont's very favorable. Um, but there are situations right on our borders uh, that we have to be uh, vigilant about and mindful of. Turning lastly to the travel map update, um, you can see here the new travel map. A couple of things we just want to point out, particularly those counties that border Vermont. Those counties are often not quarantine counties, but uh, Washington County, New York, did flip back uh, to a quarantine county this week. So just be mindful of, of folks that live on that border, what the essential travel guidance is. Uh, that leisure travel uh, is not permitted, that would require a quarantine, uh, but that there are a number of exemptions to uh, the leisure travel policy for those that are making certain types of day trips and to be mindful of that guidance on the ACCD uh, website. Otherwise, all the other counties uh, in our area um, continue to be uh, green uh, and able to go back and forth without a quarantine. Unfortunately, due to this rising increase in cases, the number of people who are eligible to come to Vermont has dipped down to 4.2 million, uh, down from 4.7 million last week, but still 4.2 million people that can come to Vermont without a quarantine. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Levine. Thank you, Commissioner Pichak. Lots of uh messages to um, re-emphasize and reaffirm um, in that presentation. So the world did just pass one million deaths, as you heard. Um, unfortunately, the United States, which accounts for only 4% of the world's population, accounts for 20% of those deaths in the 203,000 range. Vermont continues to uh, be without an additional death in the last two months uh, at 58, and we are at 1,749 cases as of this morning. Interesting tidbit is that our lab has performed almost 280,000 tests from nearly 162,000 people. I wanted to start with testing in my remarks this morning. Uh, the White House yesterday sent a letter to all state governors about Abbott Laboratories Binax Now rapid point of care tests. These are antigen tests. They're performed on a card, just like a pregnancy test would be, looking for a band of blue. Though these are not self-administered tests. These are done at a clinical setting. In the next seven to 10 days, Vermont will receive 12,000 of these cards. And sometime by the end of the year, 180,000. 
Keep in mind, I've always said that antigen testing will have a role in Vermont, and we will be releasing a health alert notification to the clinical community before the end of the week regarding these tests. The government has been uh, appropriately trying to prioritize the tests for surge areas originally and for what they are terming in that overused term, vulnerable populations. In this case, they're referring to um, long-term care facilities. They're referring to populations that are more vulnerable to the disease, like Native Americans, and even at campuses of historically uh, black colleges and universities. There is new guidance from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid in our country right now uh, regarding uh, testing, but as well as visitation policies in long-term care facilities. And uh, it's envisioned that some of the utility for these new tests will be in such facilities to enable them to comp comply and to have results back in a very rapid turnaround. Uh, certainly less than 48 hours. We envision that the uh, cards may play a role in those facilities as well, and there'll be further guidance coming out regarding their use. You've heard me speak previously about the fact that these tests can have false negatives because they're not necessarily as sensitive as some of the PCR tests. However, when they're used with uh, periodicity, on a frequent schedule in testing facilities, uh, not only long-term cares, but other settings potentially, um, the reliability does increase. One also has to keep in mind when using these types of testing, what is the prevalence of the disease in your setting? And currently in Vermont, with what Commissioner Pichak has just presented in such a low prevalence, uh, one would risk again, both false negative readings, uh, but also at times a positive reading may actually be a false positive because the pretest probability of that uh, test being positive was so low in our current setting. So just whetting your appetite with that, uh, saying we are not going to throw away these cards, they will definitely be used in Vermont, uh, but they'll be used with a significant amount of guidance. You saw a little bit of the data on our schools and our colleges and universities. And I want to just reaffirm uh, that, again, we are really not having uh, much more than a plateau in cases um, in those settings. And that the reopening has, again, continued to go very well. This was the day we typically have our phone call with all of the colleges across the state. and. Uh, Things continue to go well with regard to students and cooperation with the testing protocols. Uh, very high adherence to uh, keeping their testing obligations. Uh, great work on what limited cases there have been in terms of cooperating with contact tracing and with the health department. And also uh, in those settings um, now feeling like there could be some discussion about what about the next semester uh, and some planning to uh, begin in that process. With regard to our K through 12 schools, uh, you again saw the data, uh, no real increase in any of the number of cases. One recent case in Caledonia County that is positive by antigen test, uh, we expect Perhaps today we'll know the result of a PCR test that was ordered for confirmation. Uh, though that, um, that test result was still regarded as positive when it came to the behavior of the health department and the behavior of the school regarding uh, interpreting it as positive, doing all the appropriate contact tracing, making all the appropriate decisions regarding classes in school. And that's really the model we have that's working well in Vermont, working very closely with superintendents, principals, school nurses, um, and making sure that 
each case is treated individually and all of the right things are done. The response of our team has been swift and uh, people affected are able to then do what is needed to allow us uh, to continue to contain and prevent the spread of the virus. Um, and indeed, again, I want to reiterate that we, with our low rate that you've seen in the data today, can continue to pursue this policy of containment, finding cases through testing, and the reassurance on the slide was wonderful to show that even without the colleges, but certainly with the colleges, Vermont is doing an extraordinary amount of testing per capita. So we're not deceiving ourselves into thinking we have a low rate. We actually are spreading the net rather widely to look for positive cases and not finding them. Lastly, I wanted to just mention in terms of, uh, we'll use the word outbreaks, um, I know on the news lately, in the last several days, there's been a lot of news about a nursing home in Rutland County, uh, where two staff members were positive and one patient. Um, we're still awaiting further data, but there have been no other cases reported in that facility. The facility is practicing great infectious control practices, and all the appropriate quarantining of staff and patients has occurred that would need to have occurred. Another important point is that the CDC um, was in the news again lately with regard to a seroprevalence study. This is now antibody testing of people around the country in various, well, in many states, uh, and trying to provide the states an idea of how much disease has been prevalent over this pandemic in their state. What percentage of their population has had some contact with the virus so that they would test positive? Their data for Vermont was very reassuring uh, because it came out to be less than 1%. Uh, again, amongst the lowest in the country. There were rates that were upwards to the high teens and low 20% within that survey, depending on places that have had a lot more uh, surges with the virus. The rate that they found was very compatible with the rate of a study I talked about several weeks ago, performed uh, in concert with the University of Vermont, where the uh, rate could be estimated from the sample size that they chose to be approximately 2%. So again, very, very low. I raise that because, um, first of all, in states like Vermont, it means that we are doing our job in terms of being very, very careful, and our population is successfully avoiding a lot of contact with the virus. But because of that, and because so many people are not becoming ill, they are still susceptible to the virus. And that's the reason we continue to advise everyone to do all of the things we advise you to do every time we stand up here and have this dual policy of being very careful and doing everything you need to do and awaiting a safe and effective vaccine that can then uh, begin to help us with that rate of how many people will be immune to the virus. I won't say anything more about complacency because that has been addressed well today. Um, just remember that um, there were diseases like polio which only a few decades ago devastated millions and millions of people. Um, and now, of course, we hardly talk about anymore. So we wouldn't want people to forget about what it took to win some of those major public health battles. And a commitment to public health practices and vaccine are the pathway to helping us avoid some of those diseases from roaring back. Which is why I will now, in my final comments, segue again to the flu vaccine, because that vaccine, as it's becoming more widely available, uh, will be available to everyone in the state. And we want you to continue to think about doing that, as well as covering your coughs and sneezes, of course. The pandemic makes us forget that just two years ago, we were very, very concerned about outbreaks of measles. It's a potentially dangerous disease that has made a comeback in the United States. 
mainly because people forgot that vaccine is what has kept it at bay. Now for COVID, we of course don't have a vaccine yet, but we have to continue to sacrifice as we are doing with the way we're living our lives and keep our guard up and our masks up at the same time. Um, if you were among the crowds who were reported to be at the beach last weekend, or maybe at too large a gathering at a barbecue, it was a beautiful weekend, just keep in mind that if you think you placed yourself at risk, we have testing available in Vermont. And you should consider getting yourself tested and then reducing the risk to others who are around you. That's all I'll say for this morning, and I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Commissioner Levine. We'll open up to questions. Kevin? Well, no, I mean, I think it's anecdotal. And I think what we see is when we, we have so much success, you tend to let your guard down. I think we all do it. We're all guilty of it. And it's just a, more of a education, uh, more of a warning of what could happen. Again, I keep track of all the other numbers. I've used uh, Hawaii as an example. Hawaii, at one point, had a lower number of cases than we do here in Vermont. Uh, they were amongst the lowest. Uh, as well as Wyoming, Montana. And uh, what we've seen, uh, and, and again, uh, even though they have twice the population, they had a lower number of cases than we did. Uh, today, uh, Hawaii in particular uh, has about um, eight times uh, the number of cases we do at this point. Uh, Wyoming has gone from uh, the second lowest uh, at this point to the third lowest. They have kept creeping up. We were fifth at one point. So uh, we are the lowest uh, and continue to be, uh, but it doesn't take long uh, to change that trajectory. And it's due to opening up too fast, letting your guard down, and not following the guidelines. So we want to, if we want to continue to open up the economy, if we want to continue uh, to open up our schools for more in-person instruction, which I think is, is appropriate here in Vermont, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to see uh, some of what uh, the results of of uh, the, uh, the cases, uh, the low number of cases here in Vermont, um, then we have to stay vigilant. And um, as we continue to open up, I mean, what, you know, a few weeks ago, we opened up uh, hospitality and um, hotels to 100%. What do you see the next kind of state? Well, again, I just want to uh, stay focused on our schools at this point. I think in-person instruction, as we've heard from the healthcare experts and the experts in uh, childhood development, uh, that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, we need a more in-person instruction. Uh, and we were advised that we could do that here in Vermont. Uh, we've gone to the hybrid model. Uh, we're seeing uh, some communities, some districts, opening up a little bit more. Uh, in fact, I saw a news report today, uh, and this isn't in our state, but uh, right on our border in Lebanon, New Hampshire are going to in-person, five-day in-person instruction. Good news uh, for the region. And um, so I think we'll stay focused on that uh, and at that point uh, determine where to go next. But obviously in the hospitality sector, uh, restaurants, uh, as we know, uh, are going to their, um, some of them are getting by by having outdoor dining. And uh, as the temperature uh, decreases, uh, we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that uh, we need to provide something for uh, these businesses to do. So we may look at that uh, sector next. But again, at this point, our focus is entirely on education and providing for more uh, in-person instruction. And I guess just last question, but along the economy, um, so much of our, our uh, tourism dollars come from Canada, of course. They're still seeing really big spikes there, as Commissioner showed us. Um, I'm wondering, if and when we have a vaccine, what, and this might not even be 
your decision, but I mean, what, what, what would be the threshold for opening up the border, and what would that look like? How, how quickly would that happen? Yeah, I think it's going to be a shared agreement, obviously, with the United States and Canada. Um, I don't know if the states are going to have all that much uh, say in this. Um, at one point, uh, Quebec uh, in Canada was in a better position than, than even we were, or at least uh, mirrored what Vermont was doing. And now they're seeing an escalation uh, of cases. Um, so again, uh, we would want to make sure that it's safe for both countries. And, um, and hopefully uh, it will be uh, happen in the near future, but we do rely on uh, trade uh, as well as tourism and uh, the ski season is coming up. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll all get back to somewhat normal uh, in the very near future. Stuart? Is there any talk about the uh, governor about taking temperatures and stuff at the border in either direction? Um, you, you know, I think that's more of a question, uh, again, uh, for the CDC and uh, our federal partners uh, in terms of what they will do when uh, the borders do open back up. Uh, I remember earlier accounts of uh, seeing temperature checks in other countries uh, throughout the world. So I, I don't know if that will be um, one of the requirements, but, uh, but certainly we want to make sure that everyone is healthy when they cross back and forth, regardless of whether it's the flu or the, or the coronavirus. On the uh, public school reopening, I mean, four cases across our state so far, and that's tiny compared to New Hampshire, for example. At what point, I mean, how are child care hubs protected when you have such low case counts in our public schools after three weeks? At what point do you, does it become uh, justifiable to, to really move to five person well, I think, you know, we, we to be clear, um, uh, the advocates, the, uh, Dr. Levine uh, and the health department had advocated for in-person instruction before uh, we opened up. So I think it's more viable. We've proven uh, that it's safe. And uh, I'm hopeful that more districts will follow suit. You're trying to convince superintendents? Well, I think we want to convince them by uh, watching the data and the science and uh, when they become more comfortable when parents become more comfortable when teachers and staff become more comfortable uh, and see that it's safe uh, that they will follow suit but uh, we knew we had to prove ourselves i think we are doing that uh, as we speak so hopefully uh, they will uh, there will be more that will go to five person or five day instruction uh, lastly governor are you going to watch the presidential debate tonight and if so are you for um, you know, I'm hopeful. I have a debate myself uh, tonight, uh, and then uh, and then I have all my day-to-day uh, -day activities and so forth. So I'll I'll do my best, uh, but I have a lot of homework when I go home at night. And uh, tonight will be even more complicated. But I hope to to watch some of the debate. But you might be able to resist. Yeah, that's right. We'll see. Steve. Uh, Governor, I was just wondering about the uh, the controversy. Well or lack of that, uh, of the food box distribution uh, contract being given to out-of-state companies versus the in-state companies, and um, there seems to be some uh, some pushback on that, uh, less and less service. Yeah, uh, obviously uh, this has been a beneficial program uh, for Vermont and Vermont farmers in particular and local producers, uh, and we're hopeful um, that there will be still the same contract with the same provider uh, in in state, uh, but they don't have to utilize uh, products from in state. We hope uh, that the provider will continue uh, to use some of these uh, these local uh, farmers and, and local entities and local products uh, in the near future. But uh, yeah, I share the concern of the congressional delegation in this regard. All right, moving to the phones. We'll start with Ed at the Newport Daily Express. And my question is, um, in support of opening up the schools at all grade levels, uh, you relied a lot on data that was coming from Europe. Are you still tracking that data and comparing it to Vermont? Now, I know we have only have a few weeks of school uh, data available, but are you tracking it to see how we're doing in comparison? Um, from my standpoint, I might, uh, might ask uh, 
Mr. Pichuk uh, to also fill in some of the gaps. But uh, from my perspective, it's really watching our own data at this point, uh, and that's what we have to go on. So uh, we're doing amazingly well, uh, as was uh, Mr. Pichuk had stated. There was uh, one entity that said that Vermont was in the best position to have in-person instruction five days a week, and uh, we feel the same. We felt that way before. Uh, the schools open, and we feel that way uh, even more convincingly uh, today. Anything I should add, Commissioner okay. Pijek, or would you like to add anything to that? Okay. Nothing else to add, I don't believe, Ed. Okay, very good, thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, I'm wondering your reaction to the uh, protest in Burlington turning it up not by uh, confiscating copies of seven days newspaper in Burlington, one is the area setting fire to newspapers during one of the nightly protest marches along the Church Street Marketplace last week. Uh, what does it say about censorship, the First Amendment, and tolerance in Vermont? Yeah, I thought it was unfortunate uh, in many, many different regards. Uh, I, go, I agree with the publisher, Paula. Who, uh, who made a statement about that uh, very issue. And I, I don't think I can add anything to that. I fully uh, agree with her. Um, this is, seems to be, um, you know, it's ironic in some respects that uh, they would they would do this, uh, which is exactly what they're, they're protesting against. So um, censorship isn't good. Uh, and in fact, it may have uh, backfired a bit because I believe they just published more copies and and more people probably want to read the story. Does it concern you that now the element of fire has been added to protests in Vermont, uh, much like we've seen across the country? Well, I think in this limited case, I'm not sure that it's, uh, you know, we, we've replicated that. Uh, it was in that one instance. Hopefully uh, they'll learn from that and not, uh, and not do it again, um, but, uh, but obviously, any type of uh, of, uh, of a protest that involves uh, anything that's violent or involves fire uh, is uh, is uh, regrettable. But uh, but again, uh, I, d I didn't see it replicated again. So we'll uh, we'll obviously keep our keep our eyes on this. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Peter VPR. Yeah, this question is for Secretary French. Uh, Secretary French, as it relates to in-person learning, are you, are you aware of any instances in which a district has made the decision to either go from an all-virtual learning program um, to, to a partly in-person learning program, um, or increase the number of days it's allowing students back into the building? Yeah, good afternoon, or good morning. Um, yes, I think, you know, we're seeing those cases. Uh, we are starting a formal data collection, actually, that was launched uh, yesterday, so we hope to get a better handle more formally on the trends as they're occurring, um, and certainly monitor uh, the situation statewide and possibly contemplate additional guidance uh, for schools. Thank you. Kat, WCAX. Hi. Questions about uh, antigen testing here. Is Abbott's rapid test the only one the state is going to be adopting, or are there other antigen testing companies that you would consider for use in those long-term care facilities or other such places? Good morning, Kat. Um, I mentioned the ones I mentioned because that's what the federal government is widely distributing and providing. Um, I believe they've also previously sent a limited number of Kaidel antigen test platforms. These are the more traditional. You take a sample, you run it through the machine for 20 minutes and get a result, as opposed to the cards I was talking about, where you don't actually need a machine, you just need the cards and someone to observe the sample collection. Uh, so. Um, there's still, there's already been opportunities for facilities to have the Kaidel machines if they wanted to use them. But the fact is, they're both antigen test platforms, so uh, the same guidelines would apply to either. And 
can you elaborate on what those guidelines are going to be to the facilities that you know get these Abbott tests? Yeah, um, I, I I can't give you all all the details as they're being uh, formulated and discussed within our agency of human services and department of health, but. Suffice it to say that when these tests are used in a screening mode, as they would be used in these facilities, um, they should be used uh, with, as I said, some periodicity, some regularity, so that you're not just doing a one-time screening and then a month later coming back and doing it again, but you're doing it once a week, perhaps even more than once a week. That increases the reliability of the results you're going to get. Now, if you have a nursing home located in a county that's having a big surge of activity, uh, or um, the nursing home itself has had some cases, and you're wanting to more regularly understand everyone there, or just test somebody who happens to have a runny nose on the likelihood that they may or may not have COVID, um, that is also a good use for these machines. So when a rapid answer is needed in a setting where your probability of getting a positive result is higher because the surrounding area has a high prevalence or because the facility itself is now having increasingly higher prevalence of condition. Because that would allow you to very quickly um, cohort your patients or staff in a way that you would keep them separated from one another so that those who are free of disease remained in one uh, portion of the building with one set of staff, and those who were becoming positive could be appropriately housed in the same uh, wing of the building, let's say. So, so they do have utility in those settings. And because I know I have several families who've been asking me this about rapid testing, if it is something that a family could commit to regularly doing if, say, their elderly spouse wanted to visit their partner who was in a long-term care facility, if they could commit to a, you know, once a week test, would they be allowed that or is that just staff only? Yeah, that, that, that would be a use that um, at the present time I would not be sure that we would want to uh, suggest be, become a routine for such a family. Um, again, we're, we're not looking to provide a level of false reassurance. We want to be totally reassured, because the last thing we want to do is introduce any potential infection to a building um, that we're trying to protect in all other ways. So at the moment, I would want to say that uh, that is not a use that we have uh, explored further, nor has it been one that's been recommended to us. Okay, thank you. Lisa, Associated Press. Hi, thanks. Um, <clears throat> this is also a question for Dr. Levine. Just one clear back to the um, Rutland nursing facility. So how, how many of the test results have come back? You're still waiting for some results? I, I can't give you a number on the number that we don't have a result on. All I know is the testing has been facility-wide. So, so, when, when we, so when we have results, we'll, we'll know that they're based on a denominator that's pretty much the whole facility. And okay. the staff were getting tested one day and the residents another day. So we shouldn't expect to know both uh, at the same time. and that's ongoing right now? Yes, yesterday and today, actually. Okay. Okay, thank you. And those are being done at our state lab, so we will have the results in less than 48 hours, depending on when they arrive at the lab. All right, thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Greg, the County Courier. Last call, Greg. All 
was thinking, I was hoping maybe um, Dr. Levine could talk about this new data from the CDC on um, how older children seem to get uh, COVID at a higher rate than younger children do. Um, does this have any, what, what do you take out of the study and do you think it has any significance for how school officials should be planning their reopenings and, um, you know, other things right now? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, they actually kind of reaffirm a lot of what we've set up here and what we've been thinking about in the past. We know that um, the reason we have had more confidence talking about getting the K through five population back in school in that in-person learning uh, is because of the fact that, as you stated, their, their rates uh, and this is more data to support that, seem lower than the more adolescent age, age range, and specifically more so than the high school uh, age range, which, which act a little more like the adult world in terms of their rate of infection. So it certainly says a lot for the fact that uh, K through five in person seems to be from the data and from our current experience uh, a safe enterprise and that we should try to maximize the uh, benefit that that population can get from in-person experiences. On the other side of that though is the, the high school years uh, which fortunately as we all know and as they know uh, have been more prepared and are better able to work in a remote environment so should there be problems with cases in that age range um, there's better alternatives for their learning uh, to continue. But again, it doesn't mean we don't return students in those ages to school uh, by any means. Um, and uh, we're again showing success in that in Vermont as well. I think for Vermont, the bottom line is still, if you're operating, whatever you're operating, whether it's a school or a prison or a long-term care facility, in a state with low prevalence, you will have cases, but you will do much better than in places that have high prevalence. Uh, and that should be the rule of thumb. There's also another CDC study that looked at the distribution of uh, age in the pandemic in the United States between May and August uh, of this year. And what it essentially says is that as opposed to very early on in March, April, May kind of range, when we were seeing uh, the older population more frequently affected and having worse outcomes. In this more recent uh, activity from May through the summer, the 20 to 29 age group actually made up a very large percentage. And you could actually sequentially track uh, activity in that age group and then subsequent activity in older age groups. Um, Again, just reinforcing what we all know, though, that is no matter what age we are, we all need to really do our best to try to conform to the guidance that we've been talking about with physical distancing and masks, et cetera, um, because the entire population benefits, and that's really, really important uh, focus for us all to have. So um, just as kind of a point of clarification, I see, I noticed that there haven't been any new um, school case cases last time we talked. Has there been any evidence of transmission of cases in schools uh, from those few cases that we have? Thank you for letting me make that really important point. Thus far, we have not seen any evidence for transmission of COVID-19 within schools. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hello, this is probably a question for Lindsay Curley. We understand from talking to local inn and lodge owners that they are vetting every potential visitor to make sure they're following Vermont's guidelines in terms of quarantining and visiting. To the state's knowledge, are Airbnb and other businesses like VRBO vetting visitors to Vermont for compliance with the guidelines? Airbnb hosts have reported that vetting is not their responsibility. 
I, yes, I, I can answer that. They are supposed to be vetting. They are supposed to be doing the same that our lodging, other lodging properties are doing. As you might imagine, um, it's difficult to enforce, um, but we have made attempts to ask and ensure that they are following the same rules. Is there any kind of state follow-up, or are you are you receiving reports of failure to comply? And if so, how does the state follow up? So I have not, for our agency to my knowledge has not received uh, them as of late. Um, there may be some reports out there and we, we do follow up if we get a report. Um, but certainly if folks want to reach out to our agency or to the Vermont State Police, they can report that. Um, it can be confidential and we can follow up. Great, thank you. I'll share that with the reader who brought it up. You bet, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Hello. Um, with the ski season approaching and, um, you know, often express concerns about um, the problem of people in the hospitality industry being out of work, um, how are plans going for loosening things another notch? Is that something that is um, in, the, in the foreseeable future, or are the rules um, keeping uh, public spaces down to 50% um, going to continue indefinitely? Well, again, um, Joe, we want to open up these sectors as quick as we possibly can um, when it's safe to do so. Um, right now, our focus, as I said before, is on schools, uh, more in-person instruction. Uh, we want to get through that hurdle first, uh, but we are uh, continuing to have uh, discussions with the ski industry uh, to see how we can help them in some way in order to do it safely. Um, so we'll be looking um, for some of the restaurants uh, and uh, trying to adopt guidance that would uh, would help uh, in that regard. But uh, until there's a, a you know significant change uh, in, in watching the modeling uh, from around uh, the the region, uh, we've seen uh, where there's a just an increase in the number of cases that are starting to surround Vermont. So I'm a little concerned. Uh, but, uh, but again, we'll continue to do everything we can to help these entities uh, survive through this, uh, this winter season in order for them to thrive in the future. Um, given that it, the answer appears to be um, that nothing can be done while the number of cases in surrounding states um, continue to rise or at least don't fall substantially, um, is there any prospect of additional help in the way of uh, unemployment support um, for people who are simply out of work uh, through no fault of their own? I know that uh, it took a long time to get the $300 thing off the ground and that there were limited funds there. Is there any prospect of any help for people beyond that? Uh, first of all, Joe, I just want to make sure that everyone uh, understands that our travel guidance uh, provides uh, that somewhat protection. Uh, and as long as everyone follows the, the guidance that we have in place, even from other states, uh, the safer we'll be in Vermont. So um, I, I, I don't want to uh, to uh, to uh, lead anybody in the wrong direction. Uh, again, I'm concerned about what I'm seeing in terms of uh, the number of counties that are becoming red and, and approaching, uh, you know, going from green to yellow and so forth. Uh, but that's just exactly why we have our travel guidance in place uh, to protect uh, Vermonters and those who travel here. So as long as everyone adheres to that, regardless of what happens outside our borders, we'll still be protected. Um, so. Um, we want to, again, um, provide a relief for them as best we can. Um, it's going to take some, some action uh, by Congress, uh, to be honest with you. 
uh, in terms of uh, providing for more assistance. Uh, I believe it may not happen until after the election at this point, uh, but I believe that there will be a, a move to uh, provide relief. And remember, uh, the uh, initially, uh, it was actually uh, the, the president who moved forward with this extra $300. The other uh, $600 program had just lapsed, and uh, Congress did not take action. Uh, the president moved forward with the FEMA funding for a three-week period uh, and then uh, determined that there was more money available uh, and we were able to go to another three-week period. Uh, but we're closing in on the end of that as we speak. So uh, it's going to take Congress uh, to take some action at this point. Uh, the, uh, the legislature uh, followed my, um, my uh, 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 guidance in terms of uh, the extra, it was 20 million we'd asked for, which would amount to about $100 a, a week uh, for those who are unemployed. But again, that doesn't fill all the gaps. So uh, we need congressional action in order to, uh, to provide for that relief for those who are unemployed. We still have uh, a little over 30,000 uh, people unemployed in the state, down from almost 90,000 at one point, which is good news. Uh, but there's still 30,000, which far exceeds anything we've seen in in recent history. Thank you very much. Avery, WCAX. Governor and Dr. Levine, the CDC just put out guidance on Thanksgiving, just like they have for uh, Halloween. Is there any Vermont specific advice on Thanksgiving and Christmas planning that people can start thinking about, especially in light of the national forecasting projections that Commissioner Pichak just mentioned? Yeah, uh, Dr. Levine was the expert on Halloween, so I'm going to let him uh, <laughs> provide guidance for Thanksgiving and Christmas as well. In true confessions, I bought the Halloween candy already, <laughs> and I'm not planning on the one being the one who eats it. Um, so um, I think, frankly, uh, it's important that the CDC came out with guidance for those two holidays, and people do want to start making plans. But I do think we should be uh, a bit circumspect as we do that and think about what the governor just said. Um, there's a lot of data in the region around us which we're concerned about. Um, if you layer that on top of the traditional concerns about the, the colder months and people congregating more indoors, I think, frankly, for me to say too much about those two holidays at this point in time would be uh, a bit premature, and I wouldn't want to steer people wrong. Um, you know, the people who are going to fly here to, to be with loved ones are still going to be under the same constraints no matter what I say today, depending on what region of the country they're coming from. Our quarantine rules aren't changing at all with regard to that. But in terms of just, you know, how people can behave during those times, uh, it'd really be too early for me to comment on at this point. I mean, my hope is it would be like Halloween, the way we're planning, where our prevalence rate is still very low. We don't advise kids to get into huge parties or their parents to um, sponsor those huge parties uh, for kids, uh, and that we don't want them to go around house to house in uh, huge hordes that are all next to each other, uh, much smaller groups. But, you know, I don't want to say too much more about the other two holidays. Just want to be cautious and be able to advise based on the data, not advise based on well, my hopes for those holidays. And you mentioned briefly the quarantine requirements, just the general travel requirements, including the quarantine requirements. Do you, so you don't foresee any changes to that as um, people typically like to get away to warmer weather in the winter or general holiday travel? Well, again, I think, uh, I don't think anything's really changed in what we're seeing around the country or the outbreaks that we're seeing in all different parts other than in the Northeast and in Vermont in particular. Um, I don't see our travel uh, policy changing in the near future. Uh, quarantining uh, when you're coming back into Vermont, obviously we don't have much to say when you travel out of Vermont, uh, but when you're coming back in, uh, still it's a 14-day quarantine period, uh, although you could test after a seven-day quarantine uh, to, uh, to, to uh, get a test uh, at that point. Thank you both. Andrew, Caledonian Record. 
Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, this is for Dr. Levine. Uh, can you further explain the situation at the St. John's Free School um, and the differences in the test that produced what you're labeling the presumptive positive versus um, what I presume is the PCR follow-up? So to handle the second part of the question first, the test was an antigen test. And being an antigen test um, in a place that has a low likelihood of having a lot of positive tests uh, in terms of the number of cases we're seeing in that part of the state, um, we would regard the test as a presumptive positive. That has to do with pretest probability and process probability. Uh, clinical reasoning argument, if you will. So we would want to have a confirmatory PCR test at that point in time. Um, there's not much more to say about the situation at the school um, because, like I said, we're regarding the test for the purposes of what we do in public health as a positive test until proven otherwise. So all the appropriate advice was provided to the school regarding uh, who needed to be contact traced, um, and plus the school helped us understand who needed to be contact traced, and what the disposition should be um, of their classes there. So is it, um, is it entirely possible that this test may have been a false positive? Uh, it is possible. Yeah, I wouldn't want to say any more than that. Um, And um, it, w was this antigen test the same test uh, that was involved in the situation in Manchester back in mid-July that had all of those positives, but in the end, PCRs didn't find nearly as many? Uh, I don't know what platform uh, the test was performed on, so I, I can't really answer that question. There's only, and there's you, literally only three or four in the country, so the odds are good that it might be the same test, but um, I can't say. And uh, not the specifics of this case, of this test, but where and, and why could someone get an antigen test in the state at present? How? Yeah, so um, one can have uh, an urgent care center or even uh, or, or another primary care practice where They've elected to uh, have that available, uh, and, and, and that's fine. You know, we're not um, saying that that's a problem at all. It's always going to be in the use of that test, not having the test or not having the test. And, you know, and that, and that test, you know, we envision that test could actually be useful even in a hospital setting. So there are some of our hospitals that are um, in our critical access scheme that don't have uh, PCR testing, um, but still need to make a decision once a patient arrives at an emergency room and might be admitted as to should they be treated as potentially COVID or not. Um, and that test would be very useful to help them triage that case uh, right at the point of care. So, you know, again, we have no fundamental problem with having antigen testing available across the state. And that's why we're putting out the health alert notification this week so that the use of that test uh, is what we focus on, not having it or not having it. And the, um, the results of the follow-up PCR, you expect those may be available as soon as today? I would, yes. Was that case in St. John's? Yes, I, I is, would. Is it possible uh, for those results to be made public prior to tomorrow's report, if they do come in? Um, if, if they're known during the course of the day today, uh, that will be listed as a positive case in our uh, daily report. Okay, thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I just have a, a question for Suzanne Yen, but first, a uh, FYI to Dr. Levine. I was in a convenience store yesterday, and it was the first time since the beginning of the pandemic where everyone was wearing a mask, so I thought that was pretty impressive. 
Um, and also the hundred dollars you mentioned, uh, the state uh, providing in the UI benefit, is, is that start to go out, or when, when do you expect it to go out? Uh, we haven't uh, technically received the the uh, budget at this point, the bill, so it has not been signed, uh, but we haven't even received it. Okay, but it's it's in there, so people can. Yeah, but we haven't. Yeah, we haven't put it into place at this point. Right. Okay. So if they got the uh, the other three hundred from FEMA, that they they could expect that that extra. Well, I think it's uh, you know to to be honest, I I'm not sure that we're, whether we're going to backdate that or it's going to be starting at the point where we run out of the three hundred and just go to the one hundred uh, at this point until Congress acts. So I'm not I'm not sure at this point. Okay. Uh, well, that's good. Uh, for uh, Victory Young, I, you know the revenue report came out on last Friday, and I know there is the, you know the data is a little mixed up because of the pandemic. But the August numbers for the personal income tax actually looked pretty good. And I was wondering if you had any further thoughts about um, what that says, and um, if there's any, can you see any any trend going forward, or, or why that might have been? Excuse me. Thank you. I had to get off mute. Um, yes, the, uh, the trend in August for the personal income tax, that was uh, um, one category of tax that, that led the rest in terms of uh, funding and over target by about 16 million, I believe, or 17 million in the general fund um, after we accounted for the deferred taxes. So you're right, it is a little topsy curvy in the last two months because of the deferred 20 revenue. Um, I think it's, it's too soon to tell um, exactly you know, why that is happening. Uh, our economists are, are basically um, you know, advising that we, we get through these two months of um, revenue reporting uh, that has been sort of turned on its head because of the pandemic and, and take a closer look at September uh, and, and see if these trends, you know, this, this trend against t Target continues. Um, mostly uh, in the general fund, most the uh, receipts that overperformed were in um, discrete, uh, almost like one-time um, categories such as the estate tax, uh, the um, fees, some fee receipts that we were catching up on uh, since the pandemic, and some of the health care revenues that, that came in a little higher than targets. And that accounted for most of the, um, the uh, overage uh, compared to target in August. Well, that, that's why I have to ask about the first thing. Yeah. So but it's also noticeably uh, up as well. So that's why. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yep, thank you. Guy Page. Governor, last night, Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana said Senate Democrats are moving away from representative government and towards what he calls declarative government in which bureaucrats make policy. Would you say that the Global Warming Solutions Act fits this general description and does your administration have any specific plans to contest the GWSA? Yeah, we're still contemplating that uh, guy. I mean, I have concerns, as I said before, uh, about the constitutionality of the Global Warming Solutions Act, as well as some of the process in place, but mainly, mainly uh, the uh, constitutional aspect, uh, because again, they can, uh, the legislature can give up its authority um, but um, and that's all fine and well, uh, but they can't circumvent the executive branch, and that's what they've done. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you expect a uh, when do you expect to make a decision on a, whether the administration actually would be would be uh, party to a, a challenge? Well, again, uh, we're reflecting on that as we speak. Uh, we're still trying to catch up from. Uh, all the action in the legislature, uh, waiting for some bills to arrive. We don't have any on my desk at this point, uh, but there are a number uh, that were passed at the last minute uh, that will uh, need some attention. So we'll uh, we'll we'll do that and then uh, move on from there. So uh, a lot going on okay. in terms of uh, the action taken in the legislature, the pandemic itself, uh, trying to build a budget uh, for the next fiscal year, which is 
coming up uh, sooner than we'd like uh, because they'll be back in session within uh, two to three months. So uh, it's going to be a very, very short uh, turnaround time. Uh, Governor, CNN and Fox both reported that uh, last night many police departments nationwide lost 911 service and other computer services for a period of time, apparently due to a problem with Microsoft. Was Vermont affected? And if so, uh, how and in the future, what should Vermonters do if they find that no one answers 911? Yeah, we, uh, I asked that very question this morning at a cabinet meeting uh, of our ADS Secretary, Secretary Quinn. Uh, he wasn't aware at that point uh, as to whether um, 911 was affected here in Vermont, but certainly the Microsoft issue affected our email. So, um, yeah, it's concerning. I'm, I'm not sure what uh, what action we could take. I don't even know the cause at this point. Um, but, uh, but again, uh, Secretary Quinn is uh, trying to get to the bottom of that as we speak. How was the email affected? Um, just it weren't able to send uh, because of and the team's meetings and so forth with the new technology uh, that we're all adapting to. So it had an effect on uh, on some of the emails coming through, but I think they eventually did. Okay, thank you. Pam Davis. Uh, this is a question for Governor, for uh, Dr. Levine. Uh, Dr. Levine, we've got some very good information today on the whole antigen field and, and what it what it looks like now and, and, and how it's going. I have two questions to you. The first one is the I believe that the essence of the whole group for the antigen uh, test is based on an assumption or a conclusion that if you have that it's okay to have a test that has very high false uh, negatives on the assumption that if a person has only a small amount of uh, virus on him or her that that person is not likely to transmit it my first question i, I like to ask, ask two at a time my question is what is your view of the scientific validity of that do you have a sense of where the lines cross on the point at which you can put people relatively or significantly safely together on the basis of a test that has a lot of false negatives. You have your own opinion. The second is, uh, the second question is, on the question of the holidays coming up, I wonder if you just would be willing to go out farther over your skis on that. The reality, it seems to me, is that, Chris, that uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas are the two preeminent uh, holidays in the year when families gather, and they gather from all over the place in a mobile Society. And I, my feeling is that the that a combination of two week uh, uh, quarantine windows and uh, a full reliance on the uh, on the PCR test simply is not going to get it in those in those two holidays. The pressures are going to be huge. And so my question would be, will you do what would you be able to do to make it possible to be able for families that need to foregather? on say Thursday be able to get tested on Wednesday so that they can do it. Those are my questions. Thank you. Good. So we'll go back to the first question first. Um, I'm not going to give an opinion. I'm going to give you what we know. Um, and what we know is based on extremely limited data. But it's very challenging to correlate having a positive antigen test for SARS-CoV-2 and how likely is someone to be infectious. We like these tests to be used in the first five to seven days of symptoms because we think that's when a person um, will be most likely to have a true positive result and that correlates with a period that we're worried about them being infectious, obviously, and that's where, why they're isolated when they develop symptoms. But later in the course, these tests might be able to still be positive, but it would be very challenging to know, is that just finding some virus um, on the nasal swab because they're very, um, they're, they're able, their ability to pick up the virus is very good, or is it because that person still is a 
capable of transmitting infection to others. And we just don't know as one gets later in the course. So I'm giving you not the full opinion answer you want because I can only base what I say on the data that's out there right now. With regard to the holidays, I'm going to continue to not go over my skis and say that it's too early for me to give a lot of good advice. Um, and we're in a pandemic, um, so I, I have the right to be able to say that today. Um, and I don't think people would want to be going too far over their skis and uh, making assumptions about what Christmas is going to be like in terms of the disease. I'm very struck by the data that Commissioner Pichak showed for the region, for Quebec, um, and for the projections around the country. Um, and we have to just be as cautious as we can be and still hope that we'll continue to maintain our really extraordinary performance here. Um, and I, I think part of your question was inserting a, um, a testing component into the whole mix. But again, you know, no matter what test, antigen test, PCR test, whatever, we still stand by this one statement. If your test is negative, it's negative that moment in time, and that's all it means. And if you're coming from a place that has a lot more prevalence of disease, that negative test at that one moment doesn't rule anything out. And uh, just to follow up on uh, Stuart's question from very early today, even a temperature that's normal won't really help at that point in time either. I'd love for the temperature to be integrated with all of the symptom checklist, which it would be. Um, but from our Vermont data, looking at all of the cases we've had, less than 50% of our Vermonters presented with the symptom of fever when they were first diagnosed. Doesn't mean they didn't develop fever as they got more ill in the course, but they did not present with fever. So the pickup rate wouldn't be as good as we'd like still. And with regard to the, uh, the holidays, just to finish up, the, um, the reason you know, we have this sort of period of time where we're sending the students from college home Thanksgiving and they're staying away till sometime in 2021 and the colleges are actually working with us on what that date would be, but it's not going to be January 1st. Um, that gap in time will be very important towards uh, making sure that we can return them safely with the same kind of testing and quarantine protocol that we did back in July and August uh, to make sure that Vermont is um, protected again, if you will, from people who are coming back here for a good reason, but they're coming from potentially a place that's yellower or red. Does that cover him? Well, it, it, uh, as well as I think it can be expected. I think the, the problem I the problem I have, okay, is the practical world. Okay, somebody right now, my family has got to figure out whether we can have Thanksgiving with 15 people. Okay, and the reality is that all of those things which you say are true. All of the stuff, information you put out is totally true. The question I have is whether it will work in the practical world. The pressure for people to gather isn't just the kind of pressure you get to have a fraternity party or something at a beach, something that is just sort of basically done, okay? But there's more than one way to die, and people have not been able to put their families together since last Christmas. And, if, and so the question is, we need as much guidance as we possibly can, and I, and I, I, I can't hear it from you, Dr. Levine. I want to know whether if I can get my whole tribe tested with an antigen test the day before Thanksgiving, in which they are all negative, is it, should we have Thanksgiving dinner together or not? Are they all coming from Vermont? Uh, mostly. Because I, again, want you to look at the data that was presented today, about 0.5 million people are no longer eligible within the last week to come to Vermont because their color has changed. And it changes both ways over the last month or so, uh, but it's been changing in the wrong direction in the last week. Um, and so when people are making travel plans either to come from Vermont or to leave Vermont to go visit their family, um, they're taking that kind of a risk that we can't really advise them on. 
because things change so I quickly. What, I, I, know what, I know we're taking that kind of risk. The question is, the question is, is the risk, the question really is, can the risk be managed intelligently yes. by an antigen test? Yes. Yes or no? So the answer is yes with prior good behavior and depending on where a relative is coming from with quarantine if needed. Uh, the combination of those two would be wonderful. Having just the negative test to allow them to come sit around the table could be falsely reassuring, so I just have to put it out there. And we got to move on well, to our, our next question. Now I've, got, now I've got it. Thank you. Okay. And Pam, if it makes it any easier, you can take me off the list to reduce that from 15 to 14. Steve, any KTV? Can you hear me? We can. Um, a quick one for the doctor and then one for the uh, uh, governor, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, earlier, the IHME was referenced uh, for their modeling. Um, hasn't some of their modeling proved to be like wildly inaccurate um, since this whole thing began? Might be a better question and for Commissioner Pichek, if you don't mind. Sure, and, and with the cases, with the amount of testing we're, we've been seeing increasing, um, didn't we expect that the amount of cases would be increasing? And if you look at the amount of cases uh, compared to the fatality rate nowadays, um, hasn't the fatality rate uh, pretty much dropped through the floor? Yeah, our fatality rate is... Uh we, I don't think I don't believe we've had a death in two months. I uh, want well, nationwide too. Uh, thanks for that question, Steve. On the first point, so we put two models together on that one slide. It was IHME and another model uh, from Yu Yang uh, Gu, and we did that because you're, you are right that you know it's important to back check your models um, and. We do that on occasion, and I think we've mentioned that we work with Oliver Wyman quite closely, and they do that same analysis as well. And the two models that perform the best are um, the Yu Yang Gu model and the Oliver Wyman model, sort of consistently over time. IHME has, you know, had to revise their forecasts as things change fundamentally about what they know about the virus or what is happening uh, in the country, new information that's come in, um, but. I think they both are telling the same message. Again, one that's been the most reliable model, um, backdated, uh, backchecked by the CDC and others, uh, and the IHME model saying that cases are likely to increase uh, in the fall. Sure, uh, thank you. And one for the governor, if I may. Go ahead, um, Steve. Governor, with the, uh, hi, thanks. Um, with the, Global Warming Solutions Act, I guess this question is kind of existential, but um, David Attenborough was on 60 Minutes uh, last Sunday, and he was basically saying that, that, that humans are ruining the planet. And I, I remember during the 70s when zero population growth um, was, you know, uh, kind of like mentioned and for sustainability. I think we did that um, in Vermont, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if if, if humans are ruining things, uh, wouldn't it be a, a good idea to to go from uh, from a dynamic model to a static model? Where, I, I mean, even if people, your average family had had just two children, that it, it would uh, help with sustainability, yet not blow holes in the labor force. Well, again, here in Vermont, we suffer uh, from a shortage of people. Um, we have a workforce shortage that was pre-pandemic uh, that will continue. Um, we have uh, such a low, I mean, we're, our population is receding, um, not, uh, not advancing. So we have uh, the opposite problem with maybe some other states. So I wouldn't advocate for that here in Vermont. We need, again, we need more people. Um, we've, we have fewer kids in our schools. Uh, and uh, fewer workers for the workforce, and it hampers our ability to grow the economy. Um, so in terms of the Global Warming Solutions Act, though, 
Again, I, I agree with the goals. I mean, I think climate change is real, but I think we can we can have an effect on that. And I think the, the sooner we get to uh, electric vehicles, the uh, sooner that we get to uh, more uh, electric uh, heating and so forth, uh, the better off we're going to be. But particularly uh, in the transportation sector, which is arguably, I've heard two st uh, statistics, uh, somewhere between 45 and 60 percent uh, of the uh, carbon emissions are from transportation. So the quicker that we can get there, the better. And uh, uh, another quick one, um, regarding JP up here, uh, a good portion, I'd say maybe almost 50 percent of, of their uh, of their ski traffic is is from Canada, and uh, if the border's not reopened, is there any way that uh, that we might be able to uh, to to keep them uh, in business somehow? Well, we certainly hope so, uh, Steve. I mean, that's what we've been trying to do throughout the pandemic is uh, trying to give grants and so forth, economic relief uh, to the businesses here in Vermont so they can survive uh, throughout the pandemic. So we'll be watching, obviously, that. We've given uh, money to ski areas. There's money in the uh, budget, I believe. Uh, I think it held uh, that there's money, money for the ski areas, uh, which should be, should be helpful. Um, but, uh, but again, we might have to look for other ways uh, to create more traffic. If, we, if the border is not open, uh, maybe there will be some from other states coming from safe counties throughout the region who would like to explore uh, JP, who haven't before, uh, because it's a beautiful place uh, and, uh, and great skiing. So, uh, so we'll have to try and do whatever we can to support them. And it's never crowded either. Well, yeah, not right now, but uh, we hope that yeah. will be a problem in the future. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. Courtney, Local 22. Governor or Dr. Levine, I'm wondering if you anticipate any new cases in Vermont um, in regards to fall tourism. We've really seen the colors start popping within the last week um, and know that's a big draw for our region. Well, uh, from my standpoint, I'll let Dr. Levine um, give his opinion as well, or, uh, although he's not giving opinions today. <laughs> he's just <laughs> relying on data. Um, but what I, uh, but I, what I would say again, anecdotally, when I'm watching the data, we're not seeing an uptick in the number of cars traveled into Vermont uh, during this time. Um, it's down significantly uh, from last year, previous years, and it's not increasing uh, previous weeks uh, that I've seen thus far. Um, again, anecdotally, I was uh, driving, or I wasn't driving; I was riding uh, on Sunday uh, to go into the office. And, um, and I saw a local establishment uh, that had the uh, beautiful backdrop of, uh, of reds and oranges and yellows and just a, a picturesque uh, kind of a picture of uh, fall foliage in Vermont, beautiful backdrop. So I took a picture of that, uh, that hotel. Um, but then when I reflected on the picture, I saw the, the front of the house, uh, which wasn't as picturesque as we normally would expect because there was no cars in the parking lot, uh, literally less than 12 cars there. Uh, and uh, at this point in time, in years past, the place would be full. Um, so we may be seeing uh, more vehicles in uh, Stowe and Manchester and some of the, and, and, uh, and some of the more um, typical areas, but, uh, but I, can, I can see uh, that we're not, we're not seeing the traffic that we normally do. Uh, Dr. Levine. The major observation I've had is we seem to be having an earlier peak. It's not even October, and so much has changed already. Um, so I think we do get a lot of our tourists in, you know, in the beginning of October, um, thinking that that's when the peak is, and maybe it still will be in select parts of the state. Um, all of our planning. Uh, that we've done in terms of staffing up our contact tracing workforce and uh, testing capability is really based on the fact that we've reopened schools, reopened colleges, and have a foliage season. Um, and we always regarded them as a group. 
uh, hard to sort of say the biggest impact will be on one part of those three or another. So I, I, I'll, I'll give my opinion. I still think that that could have an impact. Um, but I'm hoping if it has a reduced impact, it's not because no one came. Um, because we're certainly not telling them, don't come because we're afraid you're going to ruin our numbers. Um, still not, uh, we, we want them to come, period. Um, since I'm at the mic, I just have to make a teaching point uh, in regard to Ham Davis's question again regarding testing his whole family with antigen testing to see if they can sit at the Thanksgiving table. That is an example of the one time we don't want to see antigen testing used. A one-off situation where you have a bunch of people who have not been tested at all on a regular basis, none of them have any symptoms, coming to a place where there's a low rate of disease, that's where antigen testing, if it's going to have a false negative or a false positive, will be more likely to have that result. So that's why when we talk about using it in places like nursing homes or other settings, we talk about using it on a regular basis, repetitively, and not just come in and do it once and see what happens. So that point needs to be hammered home. Thank you. Alec, News 7. Alec, News 7. Star 6 on mute. All right, we'll go back to Greg from the County Courier. Governor, can you hear me? We can. All right, thank you for uh, coming back to me. Um, first off, I, I wanted to ask about a follow-up on uh, the testing for the colleges. It, it looks like we've had many more testing, uh, tests being done than students that are attending in person. Are they being tested multiple times? Yes. And if so, is there a reason uh, yeah. that they're being tested multiple times? Is it because uh, it just came back around to them or because maybe they've gotten a, a false positive or what, what might happen? That was part of their protocol. I think uh, every university might have been different in, in how they approach this, but uh, some are doing it on a weekly basis, so it's just part of their plan as they move forward. So they're adhering to the plan. In fact, UVM, I believe, uh, extended uh, their plan. They may have wanted to end or, or maybe uh, had uh, more of a um, uh, more weeks in between testing, but they've they've adhered to the plan they started with. Okay. Um, I, I've seen a moving on here. I've seen a concerted effort on social media this morning to contact your office to support the newest Act 250 reform bill and encourage you not to veto it. Uh, do you support the, the newest Act 250 reform uh, or, or do you plan to, to veto that bill? Well, again, we haven't received it yet, um, but, uh, but I was disappointed uh, in, in the end product. We started out with a substantial bill that had something in, in it for everyone uh, and when it ended uh, I believe that uh, it was just a shadow of itself and there's really only two pieces left, uh, the forest fragmentation uh, as well as uh, just an extension of the uh, uh, our review of the, um, of the trails in Vermont. So it wasn't even eliminating uh, the need for an Act 250 permit for the trails. It was just extending uh, that limitation for another year, put it off. Um, until next year, so <clears throat> we'll take a look. Um, I'll uh, I'll reflect on that. But there were a number of bills that were sent late, and uh, and I haven't had a chance to look at them. But but I was disappointed with that one. Okay, and uh, one more follow up. Uh, much like Steve, we're very close to the Canadian border up here in Franklin County, and uh, we see travelers from Quebec on a regular basis, albeit this year significantly less. Uh, but we still see travelers. Uh, coming from Quebec. Uh, with the spike in cases up there, do you expect that there's going to be more restrictions for how and when people can 
across the border, and I'm, I'm wondering what you're hearing from the federal government on that topic. Yeah, I'm not uh, hearing. Uh, I know that for people, business-related uh, folks, folks that are coming across the border to work at some of our health care, our hospitals and so forth, I, I believe uh, can cross back and forth. Um, so I'm not, uh, I don't know who can actually cross the border uh, other than for uh, um, essential workers. Um, so we, uh, again, for the longest time, we saw their numbers were, were mimicking ours, uh, mirroring ours here in Vermont. Uh, and when they we see a spike, I mean, there, there's a dramatic spike, but I, um, it's still um, their numbers pale in comparison, to be honest with you, uh, to what we're seeing in Texas or Florida. Um, they're much less than they uh, that we've seen there. So uh, they're still safer than many parts of the, the United States. Uh, there's at least a handful of state employees that, that live in Canada, come down to Vermont to work. Um, I know at least one that, that continues to do this on a regular basis. Um, if, if the numbers continue to spike up there, are you going to ask the state employees to stay where they are and, and telecommute the best they can? Or well, are you going to again, to you know, our, our vision has been to, uh, to look at uh, maybe from a district standpoint, even with Canada, um, with Quebec in particular, it's not the whole uh, Quebec uh, province. Uh, but we might have to look at their ridings and uh, which is their districts or their counties i just don't know uh, how we would be able to do that but uh, from my standpoint it isn't just shutting off canada uh, in its entirety uh, although the border does that right now uh, but we would be more strategic uh, about where they could or couldn't come from okay thank you governor have a great week all right thank you very much and we'll see you all on friday uh